Welcome back and get ready to engage your left hand and right foot. We'll look at a simple rhythmic left hand pattern called a bass line. Getting some rhythm in your left hand will help you develop it as a separate entity from your right hand and will bring more groove into your playing. In this session we'll begin learning to read music in the bass clef, which is where notes that the left hand plays are usually read. We'll also get our right foot into the action by introducing how to use a sustain pedal and how not to overuse it. Watch my left hand work and then we'll learn our first bass line. Let's go back to the tune we played in session two, When the Saints Go Marching In. We learned how to play the melody in session two, but now we're going to work on playing a bass line in the left hand. A bass line is a pattern of low notes that provides a rhythmic foundation and a groove to play the tune over. And we'll use a chord chart to represent the framework of the tune, which we'll need to put together that bass line with. The three chords of this tune are our old friends C, F, and G. We'll learn a simple pattern to use in our bass line, and I'll break it down for you, but first here's the sound of it. Yes. This pattern will start on the C chord, and the first note of the bass line is the C below middle C. Then you play the G three notes below it with the third finger. After G, come up to the next note A with the second finger. We complete the pattern back on C with the first finger. So the whole pattern, all four notes, go like this. The rhythm of the pattern on each chord and bar of the tune goes like this. Here it is on C. One, two, three, four. And again. Now I'll tap out the rhythm on the top of the keyboard here. And this is a great way to practice the rhythm as a separate entity. And we'll do this frequently from now on. So the pattern goes tapped. One, two, three, four. And again. Notice the beat of silence at the end of every bar, like this. Rest. Whenever I say rest, that's the beat of silence. And it's the same rhythmic pattern on G and F. The shape of this idea or pattern can be seen and felt by playing all three notes simultaneously. First on C, we get a shape that looks like this. And then on F, we get a shape that looks like this. And then up, up one step to G, the shape looks like this. When you play this pattern going from C to G, you'll have to connect it. So you have to connect it on C to G. And then back. The other two changes in the chord will have you going from C to F and back. So here's from C down to F. and then back to C. On the last move, we'll break from the pattern and just play C with the first finger two times, and then G with the third finger two times, and then back to the pattern on C to end the tune. Since we're using the same three fingers and shape on each line, the whole hand needs to move the fingers in this fixed position to the new chord. It's like a little claw moving around. The fingers are playing the notes and the forearm and hand move the claw into the next position and play them on the next chord. 
So now let's put our whole bass line together over the entire tune, slowly with the metronome. I set the metronome to 70 beats per minute, and I'll count us in and we'll play it together. One, two, three, four. Rest. To the G. Back to the C. Down to the F. Back to the C. C, C, G, G, and then the pattern on C. Now remember, if at any time you have trouble getting from one chord to the next, isolate the point where you change from chords and revisit the fingering and the move from one chord to the next. Also, slow down that tempo when you need to, and remember the practice motto, slow it down and break it down. Now we'll see how this bass line fits in with the melody of When the Saints Go Marching In. I'll count it in and we'll follow the left hand in the chart. Don't worry about playing the right hand for now. Just hear it as it goes by and concentrate on playing the left hand in time and hearing how it fits in with the melody. One, two, three. Notice that there's a little dialogue, a little give and take between the right hand melody and the left hand bass line. In the first two phrases, the left hand is answering the melody. Here's the melody. Here's the left hand. It sounds like a line a tuba would play at Mardi Gras to me. Now we'll play this bass line all the way through, and this time I'll put some right hand rhythm chords against the bass line. I'll count us in and just play the left hand and hear how the right hand chords sound against the left hand. One, two, three, four. Almost got a little reggae with the right hand there. The more you develop the left hand strength and independence, the more you'll be able to keep a bass line going while you play complementary rhythms, melodies, and chords with the right hand. Here's an advanced example of independence between left and right hand in an original New Orleans flavored bit I wrote. Getting to something like that takes a good amount of time, but that New Orleans bit you're playing on Saints is a lot of fun too. Your left hand can, can not only supply the foundation for chords, it can also play the melody. For those of us like me who are very right-handed, the left hand takes a bit more time to get moving than the right, but that's all right because in general, it'll play a more supportive, though vital, role. It's also fun to experiment with playing chords and melodies in different ranges. And playing a melody in your left hand helps strengthen it and opens up your ears to hearing it in a new range. Let's go back to the melody of When the Saints Go Marching In. Only this time, let's give it to our left hand, down an octave from before. When we played Saints with the right hand, we started on middle C with the first finger. Now let's play it with the left hand very slowly, starting on the fifth finger. Your hand will stay in that one position. Each finger plays or stays over one note, and you already have that melody in your ear. Here are the fingers in each phrase. Phrases one and two use fingers five, three, two, and one. So they sound like this. And then the same thing again. 
And then phrase three starts like the first two and then goes somewhere else. Five, three, two, one, three, five, three, four. Phrase four uses fingers three, four, five, five, three, one, one, two. Phrase five goes three, two, one, three, five, four, five. And again, we'll break this down further in the workshop. For most of us, this melody will be harder to play with the left hand, especially with the fourth and fifth fingers. In the left hand, we'll mostly be playing low notes to support the right hand, bass lines, and eventually chords with the left hand. But I want you to become aware of the piano's possibilities with these lower notes and also to strengthen your left hand. The left hand of the piano is usually represented in written music on a separate staff from the right hand's treble clef. The clef on this lower staff looks like this, and it's called a bass clef. The bass clef staff is written parallel to and just below the treble clef staff. So when piano music is written out, there are two staffs. The upper one is the treble clef staff for the higher notes on the piano, and the lower one is the bass clef staff for the lower notes on the piano. Just like on the treble clef, notes can come on the lines or the spaces or above the lines or spaces. The lines of the bass clef are the notes G, B, D, F, and A. A traditional way of remembering them is good boys do fine always. And these are those five notes on the piano. G, B, D, F, and A. The notes on the spaces of the bass clef are A, C, E, and G. And here they are on the piano. A, C, E, and G. Using leisure lines above and below the staff, a middle C on the bass clef will be the first line above the staff, and the space below it will be a B. The first line below the bass clef staff is an E down here. The first space below the bass clef is an F, and so on. Now let's go back to when the saints go marching in, in the lower octave in the left hand, we just practice, and see how it looks going by on the bass clef staff. One, two, three. Rest, rest. Rest, rest. We'll get to the different note and rest values soon, but for right now we're just focusing on the lines and spaces of, this, of the staff. I just made a whole bunch of notes ring at the same time using the sustain pedal. The sustain pedal is a useful, though often misunderstood and frequently overused part of the piano. This pedal is located at your feet below the keyboard and we play it with our right foot. The sustain pedal can be used to keep the sound of the piano ringing after your hands come off the note. On an acoustic piano, the pedal also opens up the sound of the instrument and makes it breathe. On a digital piano, the sustain pedal is an attachment and should sit approximately where the sustain pedal sits in relation to the keyboard on an acoustic piano. Using this pedal allows you to stack chords or notes without losing the sound of what was played before using it. To hear this pedal working, let's play a C triad rooted on middle C with the sustain pedal down and keep going up in C triads. As long as I keep the pedal down, all those notes will keep ringing. And I can play any other kind of chord, they still ring. Now let's do the same in the left hand. We'll start by playing a middle C, and then play all the C's going down the keyboard while holding the sustain pedal down. 
and you can hear that all of them keep ringing. Here's the pedal used to stack notes that way. The pedal's down and I'm stacking the chords up and I take it off and put it back down every time I change a chord. So here's where I change the chord. And here's the chord change. So the pedal went up when I changed the chord. In written music, mostly in the classical idiom, notations of when to put the pedal down are shown by pedal markers like this. These markers show when the pedal goes down and when it comes back up and when there's no pedal marker at all, the pedal's not played. Using the sustain pedal can be useful, but the pedal should be used judiciously because it can cause you to blur melodies, rhythms, or progressions unintentionally. Here's an example of a melody being blurred by overusing the pedal. Sounds kind of spooky that way. Now here's an example of a rhythm figure being blurred by overusing the pedal. In general, you don't want to use much pedal when you're playing rhythmic figures. Finally, here's an example of a chord progression being blurred by overusing the sustain pedal. That's because I don't change the pedal when I move on to the next chord in the progression. In general, highly rhythmic pieces should use little or no pedal. For example, when I'm playing a ragtime piece, the notes need to sound like this. But when I use the pedal, they sound like this. Let's try using the sustain pedal on our first chord progression. We'll play our first pr chord progression first without the pedal. One, two, three, four. Now we'll put the pedal down as we strike the first chord and lift it up as we play the fourth statement of that chord just before we change to the next chord. Then put the pedal back down when we play the second chord and leave it down when we strike the third chord because these chords are compatible enough that it makes a nice effect to pay them, play them both with the sustain pedal down. So the whole thing using the pedal this way sounds like this. One, two, three, four. and change the pedal and then change it again. Practicing without the pedal helps us to develop our ability to connect things musically using our body. The wrist and forearms are mostly responsible for connection at the piano when we're not using the pedal. Practicing with the pedal and using it well will also allow us to get other colors and sounds from the piano and to, and to use a large range of the piano at once. Check out this classical piece and how I can play the chord and the bass note with the left hand by using the pedal. And it connects them. The bottom line on when to use the pedal is use it judiciously, never allow it to muddy the picture, and don't use the pedal to attempt to connect what your body can connect better and cleaner. This session's nugget is really more of a don't, and it is don't overpedal. Develop an awareness of when you're using it. Practice without it unless the thing you're practicing really needs it, and change it often when you do use it. Practice purposefully and use the pedal judiciously, but after you've done that, try to experiment with the pedal, stacking chords and finding melodies or ideas that sound good with the pedal down, like this. Well, we've come to the end of session four, and we learned some new tricks in this one. 
using our left hand on bass lines and on a melody, and using our right foot on the sustain pedal. We'll build on that left hand foundation as we go along so that it anchors, drives, and complements what the right hand is playing. We also began reading in the left hand's clef, the bass clef. Get ready to hone these new skills in the workshop and to play that bass line along with a great band on the play along CD. So work that left hand.